Great, so welcome everybody to Bridging Voices Virtual Training, Positioning Pals for Eye Tracking Success. Uh, my name is Karina, I'm the Executive Director of Bridging Voice, and I'm so excited to have you all here. Um, we have people dialing in from all over, let's just look at the chat, uh, from Indiana, Colorado, Canada. We have a lot of people from Canada, welcome. Um, Maryland, North Carolina, Vegas baby, hi Angie. So glad you could join. Uh, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Oregon, it's awesome. Um, so as I said before, we know that we have, we're just so thankful that you're here and we have a lot of incredible expertise. We have a lot of practitioners on this call. We have a lot of pals, a lot of caregivers. You guys have so much knowledge. So please throughout the training, if you have insights, questions, recommendations, please drop that in the chat and we will get to it during our Q&A at the end of the training. Stockholm in Australia. I don't know what the time difference is, but thank you guys for being here. That's amazing. Um, wonderful. Okay. So um, before we jump into today's topic, um, we have a lot of new people on the call. I know a lot of you are familiar with us, but um, for those who might be new to Bridging Voice, I just wanted to quickly introduce you to our organization. We are a nonprofit that supports ALS patients by providing holistic support for all their technology needs related to communication and alternate access. So the challenge that we saw when we started the organization a little over three years ago was that ALS patients either weren't getting the technology they needed to communicate, and even when they were, uh, a vast majority of them weren't using the technology or not using it to its fullest capabilities. So what we call technology abandonment. And we saw this as a huge issue. So our goal as an organization is to ensure that every ALS patient has access to the support and the training that they need to be able to communicate. So that's what we do. And we do that through our services, um, which are very holistic. We provide everything from education around communication options to uh, support in getting the technology Technology, the right technology um, that a uh, client needs, all the way to um, providing the training and support so they can use it. Um, and then sort of a, a specialty, specialty of ours is uh, creating the customizations, really bespoke customizations for every individual to make sure the technology is working for them. And we do all of that remotely. We work with ALS clients all over uh, the country, all over the world, and we are able to do it free of charge. Um, the last thing I'll just note is that um, most ALS clients find us through our referral partner system. So we have uh, referral partners, which are, which are nonprofits, ALS clinics, SLPs, anyone that's working um, with a lot of ALS patients um, that refer clients to us when they need our support. If you're interested in becoming a referral partner, I'm going to drop a link um, into the chat here in a minute, and you can sign up to be a referral partner. Um, okay, more people coming in. Welcome. Great, so that's us. You can check out our website if you wanna learn more, but now we're gonna to get to the good stuff. Um, so with this, I'm gonna introduce uh, Trinity Dybert, who is a speech language pathologist and an AAC specialist with Bridging Voice. She is also um, our only West Coast representative holding down Portland, Oregon for us. Um, and she is going to uh, dive into today's topic, pos uh, positioning uh, pals for eye tracking success. So Trinity, over to you. Thank you, Karina. So first of all, I want to acknowledge that this is definitely a topic that, you know, a lot of pals as well as um, support staff and clinicians and, and all of our tech partners, this is something that we all very much um, face and deal with on a routine basis. And I think that goes to show by the interest we had over 120 people interested in this session, as well as uh, 10 different countries represented it. This is huge. There's a lot of questions around this. There's a lot of challenges to this. So hang tight, hold on, we're gonna get through this. But first and foremost, foremost before I get going too far into this, I want to acknowledge that the information that, uh, that we are sharing here is definitely a collaboration between our part, you know, ourselves here at Bridging Belt, Bridging Voice, as well as many of our tech partners, as well as our other partners throughout the AAC and the ALS world. So, I mean, I, I, I cannot say that enough. And a lot of those people are represented here on this call. So if we, 
if I don't know the answers, if Bridging Voice doesn't know the answers, we will we will do our best to look for it. We're also going to share, you know, that we are working on a lot of this stuff still. Um, so we will be able to share kind of ongoing um, without a doubt. Okay, so let's start with a few questions that I feel like we often have. Have you ever had a client that has failed eye tracking? How about a client or a pal that told you eye tracking doesn't work for me? And maybe this is you. Maybe you feel that eye tracking doesn't work for you. How about a client uh, or yourself that you're no longer able to use your eye tracker? Have you heard someone say, some people just can't use eye tracking? And how many of you as clinicians or even as pals were given the option to match your eye gaze camera, just like you would match your, your AAC software? So, you know, do you ask, what do you want to do with the camera? And then decide which camera to start trying. All right, next slide. All right. So we have this video that I want to start out with from uh, one of our tech partners. Um, and in a perfect world, when everything lines up, the stars and the moon and your sign, it would work just like this. So we're going to show you a quick little video about how if everything was perfect, this is how it would work. Pause for intermission. All right, just one second. I'm going to switch over to our video. The most critical factor to successful eye gaze use is proper positioning. If the eye gaze device is not in the right position, you will not be able to do all of the amazing things that are possible with your device. Before you position the eye gaze system, make sure you are comfortable. The eye gaze device should be adjusted to you, not the other way around. There are four keys to getting the eye gaze system into the right position. One. The eye gaze device should be about an arm's length away from your face. Two, the top of the screen should be in line with the top of your head. Three, the angle of the screen should be parallel to your face. Four, if your head is tilted, the screen should be rotated to match your head. These principles apply no matter what position you are in. If you are using the device when reclined back, please follow these steps to ensure that the device is properly positioned. This may require raising the device up to get the screen parallel to your face. All right, so what happens when you don't really live in that perfect little cartoon world? <laughs> now what do we do? And this is where we all have questions. What do we do now? So I'm gonna take you guys on this journey with a lot of different things to think about when it comes to eye gaze. And again, these are things that we have seen um, in helping our, our pals. We have almost 1100 pals now that we've had the opportunity to work with. And these are all the things that we have come across as well as our tech partners and our professional partners in the industry. So let's talk about it. The first group we're going to talk about is environmental factors. One of the things I want to say is please don't feel like you need to take notes on all, at any of this and or all of this, because we're going to give you a fabulous handout at the very end that has all of these listed as like a troubleshooting guide for you. Okay. So don't feel like you have to take notes, even if you wanted to. All right. So let's talk through some of these things. So environmental factors. So as we know, environmental factors very much can impact an eye gaze camera. So shiny materials nearby, those are simple things like mirrors on walls, especially behind you, NIV mask, which as you know, if you don't know, an NIV mask is a non-invasive ventilation mask. So a lot of PALs will use 
your trilogy, for example, and then use a mask. Glasses frames can also be shiny. NIV masks are plastic, they're shiny. Lighting, very much so. We know that sunlight washes out IR and light causes pupils to constrict or the opposite. If you're in a very dark place, it causes them to dilate. I wanna share a, a great story about this. So the shiny materials on a wall. And to be honest with you, we're actually still working on solving this case. But we have a gentleman um, that I have had the opportunity to work with for a very long time. And in his bed, he sleeps with the, the head of his bed elevated. And right at the level of the top of his head is this beautiful mirror. It's a mosaic mirror made with shiny, it looks like a disco ball. So right above his head, he has a disco ball mirror. And outside, he's got these big garden windows. Outside, he's got Christmas lights that run all summer long in his garden. And he kept having issues with his communication device because when the wind was low, it would cause the, uh, the Christmas lights to blow around, which would then reflect in the shiny mirror over the top of his head and wake up his eye gaze camera. It took me a long time to figure that out, but that's just something to think about. All right, our next slide. All right, positioning factors. These are so challenging. One of the things I think I really want to hit on from the video that we just watched from Approvability is the statement that says, don't move yourself to your device, move your device to you. Because one of the things that's most imperative, especially for people with ALS, is that we really think about how you're using your muscles. We don't want you to use your muscles or to have your body in a position that's gonna cause muscle degradation even faster than what you're experiencing with your disease. It is so important. But there's so many other things that go along with that. Like, let's talk about your ability to swallow and manage your secretions and breathe and there's lots of puzzle pieces to that. So physical positioning is a really big issue. So let's talk. So if your device is too low, what happens is, is your eyelids close uh, when you're looking down towards the bottom of the screen, as well as your cheekbones block the bottom of the camera. And if you have amazing cheekbones and you love to smile, then your camera is going to bump right up against your great cheekbone. Head positioning. As you, as pals all know, as well as support, all of us who support them, head positioning is so important for so many different reasons. You've got muscle weakness, you've got position for driving, you've got position to maintain saliva, position to swallow. And then let's talk about having a tracheostomy in the middle of all of that, having your chin not rest on your tracheostomy. So head positioning is a really big factor. But another factor too is, is how stable is that head position? So for example, is your head moving outside of, your, of the head box? As clinicians who work with people with ALS, we know that when you first start using your communication device, you love to turn your head and move it all around as you're looking across the screen, especially if you have a larger screen. And it's really important to keep your head still. Um, and not that I would ever condone using duct tape, but you do have to hold your head pretty darn stable in order for, for using some of these devices. This is, I think, the next bullet here is one of the things that's most commonly overlooked um, that is something that doesn't get thought about, but I see it a lot, and that's the device not being parallel to the user. So for example, if I don't know very many pals that ever sit bolt upright because it's too difficult to breathe. So you're reclined back and then you have, you think that you need to have your computer straight up and down when the truth is you need to have your computer parallel to your face, whatever you are. And that's one of the benefits to using a wheelchair mount and having it mounted to your seat rail is as you recline to change position or to reduce pressure, Again, your computer can come go with you, but you never want the computer to be out of the plane of your body. So I like to use like the back of a chair or even in bed to be able to see what that line is. Not having the distance at the right place. And this distance is hard because some people obviously as myself have glasses and I have bifocals as well. I hate to admit that. Um, but that being said, you have, you have it set at a certain distance 
but also the computer requires a, a distance as well. So distance is definitely an important factor. Then let's talk about the inconsistencies in, up, in upper body positioning. So for example, body weakness, trunk weakness, uh, neck weakness, oftentimes as you put someone in position, they have a tendency to slip slide away. And when they slip slide away, they will get outside of the strike zone or the head box. So here I am to start and then I start to get tired and I'm leaning in my chair. And then all of a sudden now I'm no longer in the best position. So again, making, and then also weakness causing a head rotation is also really difficult because you have to look back over. And as you can see, even in mine, you can see this pupil is blocked by my glasses frame. And this one is barely hanging on before it hits my glasses frame. All right, our next slide, visual factors. These are ones that I feel like sometimes people think are an absolute roadblock or you can't get past them. So the very first one, let's talk about. Pupils are covered by the eyelids. This is also called ptosis. And so this is, I'm gonna bring myself in really close. This is where your eyelids are down really low. You oftentimes have what we call like a droopy eye is another word for ptosis, and it covers the pupil. Now this part, this next part here um, is huge. And to be honest with you, uh, our team at Bridging Voice are working really hard on this right now looking at multiple different factors, um, and I hope we can share more later. Um, we're actually going, getting a chance to meet with some ophthalmologists to discuss this further. Dry eyes. Dry eyes are huge. There's so many factors to dry eyes, especially for a pal. Medication, inability to blink, um, unable to fully close your eye all the way while you're sleeping um, is incredible. And then let's not even talk about masks that are blowing air into your eyes. But let's flip side to that. Let's also talk about pupil size. So pupils being dilated due to medication and light levels. This is huge, especially different medications that cause the pupils to dilate. Um, and then conversely, let's talk about pupils being constricted. So bright environments, medication, screen brightness, and bright back backgrounds. So for example, just even having your computer with a, you know, with a sunlight behind you, or um, it was funny, I one time told one of my clients who was in a, in a power wheelchair to do the hokey pokey and turn himself around. And he thought that I was like, you know, trying to be fun. I was like, no, you have a bright, shiny light at you turn yourself around and it was amazing as soon as he turned himself around again his computer started working with one of those sunshiny days here in Oregon that like doesn't happen very often um, and so he had never done that again and we are looking and, and dry eye is so hard to kind of to figure out because you may it's, like, it's hard to see and this is so important I, I cannot say enough how looking at eyes are important all right, next slide, please. So again, further visual factors. So nystagmus, the nystagmus is where you'll oftentimes see someone's eyes move and then they'll shimmy, move and shimmy. And this can happen uh, with both eyes or even just one eye. Um, and so really watching someone's eye closely and have them move and see if they'll shimmy back and forth. Um, and you may also not see this all the time, and this is definitely an area we're going to talk about a little bit later on where customizations can really come in and make a difference. Strabismus. So strabismus is malalignment of the eye. So you may have one pupil looking forward, and then you may have one pupil that's kind of looking off center a little bit. Um, and we definitely can address those by using, for example, um, having the camera only look at one eye. But one of the things I want to I want you to think about with this um, and this took a lot of work actually with multiple partners that happened to be here on this call. I had a very amazing um, young man who uh, he had some malalignment of his eye. And so we thought, okay, the right one seems to be more on target than the left one. The left one's kind of off to the side, but the right one is straight on. So I had him working with, it worked, you know, I had him tracking only the right eye. He was tracking beautifully, but then when I really said, I want you to focus on the left side of the screen, all of a sudden his brain switched 
has left eye became dominant, the right eye started looking off in a different direction. And now the computer is not seeing, is not seeing the left eye and the right eye is looking off someplace else. So it really took us, you know, a, it actually took uh, two pairs of glasses from the dollar store, which I guess is now the dollar 25 store, with some tape over it for me to really test this out. So I had just using the right eye, we were looking all over, but then again, when I focused him on the left side of the screen, the right eye, the brain had the left eye take over and the right eye was not paying attention at all. But something as simple as a pair of, of you know, of plastic frames from the dollar store was really helpful. Cataracts. Just because you have cataracts doesn't mean, doesn't mean you have to, I've had multiple people say, I have cataracts, I can't use eye tracking. That's not true. But cataracts are interesting because when we're doing eye tracking and doing a calibration, we can see location specific accuracy issues that again, we can, you can overcome. But something to think about too is, is that we have noticed um, is that some artificial lenses, so once you've had a cataract repair, some artificial lenses will actually give off a glare that some of the eye gaze cameras are seeing. Glaucoma is another factor. So one thing, so a couple things that we've seen is medication to treat glaucoma re that reduces the pressure in the eye can cause dry eye. Even if you're not seeing it or even if they're not feeling it, know that it is a possibility. Also be aware that with glaucoma, you need to be aware of small font and visual accuracy in terms of using it. Slow blink. Slow blink can also be a big issue because the camera loses the glint and or the location during the eye blink process. All right, here's the nitty gritty. Here we go, medication. <laughs> now, if you look at this medication, if you are a pal, a medication list, if you are a pal, a person with ALS, you're gonna notice probably you got some of these in your cabinet, okay? And if you are a clinician or a practitioner, these are things that you want to think of. So when we have an issue with a client, we start asking, what are you taking? In fact, when we do our intakes with all of our clients, is that we always ask, are you taking these medications? And we follow up. So if we've noticed that somebody was previously using their device and is now having a pretty significant difficulty using their device, we look over and say, what have you changed in your medication list? So scopolamine, scopolamine is a patch you wear behind your, behind your ear that uh, controls saliva, uh, that can cause dry eye. Atropine, hyoscyamine, glycopyrrolate. So again, these are all salivary control medications. If you hear no other medication, if you are, a, if you are somebody that works in tech or you're supporting a pal, baclofen. Please, baclofen, ask about baclofen. We're going to have a whole other discussion, hopefully very soon, about using the diagnostics from uh, an eye, uh, eye tracking or eye gaze calibration and being able to correlate to these, so baclofen. In that same sort of category, we can talk about marijuana as well. We've got opioids, again, glaucoma medication like we just spoke about, allergy medications. Like, I don't know who's not on an allergy medication or an antihistamine. And be careful because a lot of people, a lot of our pals will take a cough medication. And in that cough medication is an antihistamine. So please be aware. But if you think of nothing else and you're stuck and you can't figure out what's wrong with an eye tracking, ask about baclofen. All right, next slide. Okay, other factors. So as we all know, glasses is one of those hot topics when it comes to using eye gaze. So there are so many different features of glasses that we could talk about or not talk about. So dirty, scratched, the frames blocking the camera view of the pupil. Do you remember earlier when I was giving you that example and looking from the slide or even like right now, if I had my glasses down here, an eye gaze camera would not work because you can see that the line of the glasses is going right through the pupil. So really important to look at, especially if you've got someone that's got like short little glasses, it's a big challenge. 
uh, multifocal lenses. So what I mean by multifocal lenses, bifocals, trifocals, for example, shiny metal frames are a big challenge. Okay, so here's where we're gonna put, play a little back and forth. So some anti-glare coatings can cause issues, but then also having glasses without coating and having a significant glare on that glasses can also cause issue. Also prism lenses as well can cause issues, especially um, as you get to the outside areas. IR filters can, can cause issues for some glasses. And then also lenses for astigmatism can cause a distortion on the outside edges of it, okay? So really focusing someone in the middle is important. I wanna share a quick story about a gentleman um, uh, one of my pals who I had the opportunity to work with, he came up with a great solution for his glasses. Usually you have your bifocal on the bottom because you're looking down at something close and you're looking up for your distance. In this case, he was lying in bed with his, with his device mounted just over the top and he was looking below it to see his, to see his television. So he got glasses and had the bifocal reversed. So instead of having the horseshoe on the bottom, he had the horseshoe on the top so that he had his near vision to look up at his, at his eye gaze device and his distance vision to look down to be able to see out towards his television. It was a great solution, worked with his optometry team. It worked beautiful for him, especially because he had pretty thick glasses. We didn't have many more options. It was a wonderful, a wonderful solution. All right. Next slide. Okay, let's talk about NIV masks. So again, I'm gonna restate what those NIV masks is. An NIV mask is a non-invasive ventilation mask, okay? So NIV masks can get people in trouble in a couple different ways. If you look at the first picture at the top, you're gonna see a gentleman with uh, the NIV mask that goes up over the bridge of his nose. So the glare alone from the plastic of that NIV mask can cause a pretty significant issue for, uh, for the eye gaze camera. Um, also, the plastic over the nose can block the thinner section of the screen because remember, the cameras are triangulating from each side. So if they're trying to go across, you're gonna see that they're gonna, they're gonna cross right here at this big bulk of plastic in the middle, okay? Another thing that we've noticed recently, as well as some of our partners, is it's not just about the camera. A lot of people will use painter's tape, for example, to go to cover their mask across the bridge of their nose to reduce the, um, the glare. But something else that we're also noticing is when you use an NIV mask, they need to be pretty tight, but you've got all of these straps. So what oftentimes happens is, is that you get the NIV mask pushing up or pulling up on your cheeks. And then what happens is the cheeks then push up into your eye and you can see how much reduced my left eye is versus my right eye, which then again impacts the camera. So now you've got a much smaller area, a much smaller area for the uh, camera to visualize the pupil. But then again, as we discussed earlier, when you've got those cheeks that are up real high, the camera is running into your cheeks as well. Um, some other factors too that can impact. Let's talk about the feedback dots. A lot of us as clinicians love to use feedback dots to help you, to help pals to learn where the camera is looking versus where they're looking. The problem with that then is a lot of pals will get focused on that feedback dot and start chasing it around instead of actually going where they want to go. And then another factor that I want to bring up, which is pretty significant, especially when you start talking about PALs that are living in facilities where you have more than one caregiver. You may have caregiver turnover, or you may even um, just have caregivers of different uh, language levels or education levels. So caregiver uh, inconsistency is really big, especially in facility. Okay, let's talk about, okay, so we talked about all of the issues that are outside of the device. So let's talk about device issues. And again, this is where uh, working with our tech partners has come in really handy. Okay, 
just recently, within the last few months, a lot of these devices got hit, a lot of the communication devices that are in play right now got hit really hard with Windows updates, getting ready for Windows 11. Now, even though the devices aren't going to, a lot of the devices are going to Windows 11 right now, the Windows updates were huge and frequent and multiple times a day. And the Windows updates are running in the background and you don't even know it. So updates running in the background cause significant issues and lag with, uh, with the eye gaze camera and continue to do that if there is a Windows update running in the background. Because you've got updates running in the background, then your CPU usage can be too high, which again causes your camera to glitch out and to, tr to jump and to try to catch up. Some other issues is eye tracker software and firmware updates. So for example, um, oh, let's go on to the next one, and communication software updates. I always tell my pals, if you've been using your eye, if you've been using your eye tracking perfectly fine, and then all of a sudden, nothing else changes to you in terms of medication, and your environment isn't changing, but now it's causing issues, first thing you should do is check for your updates. But remember, you need to check updates oftentimes in multiple locations. You've got Windows updates, you can have camera updates, and you can have software updates. So checking all of those are very important. You can also have corrupt eye tracking software that needs to be addressed with technical support. Here's another one, running more than one eye tracking software. And we can see this when you get uh, one software from one company running on a different device, or even for example, running um, you know, uh, communication software with eye tracking and then a Windows eye tracking as well. So you've got multiple different things that you need to pay attention to. Also something as simple as the eye tracking module is dirty. So looking at the camera at the bottom and making sure that that stays clean. You can also have a camera hardware failure such as the LED lights are dim or they've gone out. Okay. So we've talked about all of the things that could go wrong. And a lot of those, we talked about ways to fix them. For example, NIV mask, you can get a mask that goes below the nose and not up over, or you can cover with blue painter's tape. You can address shiny frames. You can address looking behind you. Do you have a mirror? Do you have a disco ball hanging above your head? Um, are you in front of a picture window in Arizona? If you're in front of a picture window in Oregon, especially this time of the year, no big deal. But are you in front of a picture window in Arizona? Is that an issue? Do we need to be aware of the light levels in the room? Um, if you're not on a medication, all of those things, what do we do next? And I have to say, this is definitely one of our bread and butters here at Bridging Voice, as we say, we've attempted, uh, we've attempted to address all of the things that we can address outside and we can't make any more changes. This is what we've got to work with. So then we start looking with, okay, how do we make it so you can communicate knowing that we have these environmental limitations or medication limitations? This is where we get into our custom modifications. And our custom modifications allow for you to be able to access communication boards at various different levels. Now, here's an example of this. So someone who takes baclofen in the morning may start the day after they've taken their baclofen having a really difficult time communicating. So we need to use a custom modified board, such as our eight button board, our GPS board, our smart backspace board, the error correction, or the unselectable prediction board. These are all fabulous boards. Now, here's the great thing I want you to know. I'm actually gonna show them, I'm gonna show you one. But what I want you to know is, that um, we do have all of these boards. We have videos of more, I just couldn't put it all in this, uh, in this presentation. We have videos of many of these boards. You also are welcome to request a free copy of these boards. We have boards uh, for grid, as well as for um, uh, communicator. Those are the two we have. And you can, uh, we're gonna show you a link at the very end, but you also can access them through our uh, website, which is here, bridgingvoice.org. And then there's a tab that says for practitioners, and you're gonna find a lot of these boards here. 
But let's go ahead and show you uh, one of our boards it's called the GPS board. We'll show you one of the customization boards that we've come up with. Even the most accurate eye tracking users can experience difficulties with a full QWERTY keyboard, which have 10 or more buttons across a single row. If the user acquires a poor calibration, typing can be very frustrating and fatiguing. In this video, we'll demonstrate a feature which every GPS device uses to make typing easier. Let's type the word veteran. As you can see, after I type the V, all letters which won't create a valid word in the English language have disappeared. If I want to go further with the word veteran, I type the E, and now the letters have changed according to VE. Of course, at any given time, I can choose a prediction. If I'm trying to type a novel word, I can hit the reset button, which will make all of the characters reappear. This board is different than the literacy board in that it works for the entire word and for every word in the English language. It also allows the user to backspace and continue with the feature enabled. If you would like this customization integrated into a Toby board, please contact us So that is just one of the solutions. Okay, so uh, the, I have to say the Smart Backspace Board is definitely one of my absolute favorites. So please consider looking through our customizations to see if there's one that would work for you or uh, someone that you know. They're pretty amazing. All right, next slide. Okay, so here's something I wanted to share with you is how do we get everybody on the same page to know where the device should be? This is definitely one of the most challenging things, especially as you have multiple caregivers. So we got this amazing uh, picture uh, for, um, from, our, from some associates down in Australia, and I'm grateful for them for letting me share this with you. But this happens to be one of theirs that they uh, made and customized. And what I love about it, again, is it shows the client how the device is in place, which ones you should touch, which ones you shouldn't touch. So which levers you should touch, which ones you shouldn't touch, and what it should look like. And using pictures, I think, is the most, um, the most beneficial thing for caregivers, especially when you're talking across multiple shifts or different levels of caregiving, to be able to get the device in the same place for the person so that they can use it consistently. And this is one of the most challenging things in a facility. So I absolutely love these. And we have used multiple different versions of this, but I just wanted to share this one with you to give you an idea. All right, next slide. Okay, so here is the thing, here's our, here's the thing I wanted to share with you most of all. So this is our troubleshooting guide. Um, and really what it does is it walks you through, are you having issues with the track status? You know, how is the positioning? Um, and then all of the things that I had shared with you, which I know is a lot, there was just so much amazing information, um, is listed here. So user issues and device issues listed here. And I love this as a troubleshooting guide for when you think that it's just not going to work, but actually you can make it work if you just look through these things. And I just wanted to flag for everyone that we will be sending this out as a handout uh, in a follow-up email for everyone um, following this training. So you will get this in a, in a downloadable handout form. All right, you guys made it. That was a lot of information. I know, a lot of information, a lot of things to think about. 
I really hope from this takeaway that you guys know some of the most important things. That one eye tracker does not fit all. Without a doubt, try, if you are a pal, please try more than one eye tracker. If you are a clinician, please make sure that you allow your people with ALS, your person, anybody who's using augmentative communication to try more than one, okay? Feature matching, and what we mean by feature matching is thinking about what you want to do with these devices um, and, then, and then trying the things that would fit the best for you. Feature matching is not just for the software. It's also for the camera. Think about what size head box is needed. Do you need smoothing? And smoothing is where it, you know, the, 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 the dot won't jump quite a, around. It won't be quite as erratic. It'll move a little bit smoother to get to one place versus another. For example, do you want to drive with your wheelchair? Do you want to drive your wheelchair with your eye tracking? Do you need to have tolerance for various light levels? For example, I had the wonderful opportunity to work with a baseball scout. And it was really important to him that he still be able to get out onto the field and be able to do scouting with his device. And so he needed to make sure that his device worked outside. I have other pals that are bed bound and never leave their house. Different light level needs. Also the tolerance to a dark pupil. And I'm gonna leave that one right where it's at for now. And then also again, what kind of glasses and do we need to have tolerance for that? Again, if possible, try the eye tracking module in the environment that you're going to use it in, not just the clinic. So if possible, you know, ensure that someone has the opportunity to try it in different locations, you know, such as their home, not just the outpatient clinic. And how do you know that that eye tracking module is the best for the PAL unless you try the rest? You have to try more than one. And please don't give up. If you have if you have a client or you are a pal who was using eye gaze and can no longer use it, please reach out. Or if you've been told you can't use it and you never will, please reach out. All right, and our last slide. All right, so we are definitely gonna take questions. Here we've got some that were already sent to us. We're gonna take questions and we will end the recording um, at, depending on your time zone, at, on the hour, but please know that we are here to answer any questions that you may have and will stay later, as well as the rest of the Bridging Voice team. Hopefully, we'll be able to stay. You've got our email. If you'd like to request um, any of our custom pages, you can see that. And then also, you can sign up for our future trainings, as well as see our library of our past trainings. Future trainings coming up are going to be customizations, some alternative access options. Um, as well as looking at some other um, some other topics that we are excited to share with you, but not ready to announce yet. Great, thank you thank so much, you Trinity. All so much. <laughs> thank you, Trinity. That was great. So much information. Um, and just a reminder to everyone, I have shared these links to request custom pages, which you can also see short videos of on our website, um, and the link to sign up for future trainings um, in the chat. So that makes it easy to click. Um, and then as Trinity said, we will be having, this is an ongoing series for us. Um, if you have suggestions on topics that you would like to dive deeper into, also, we'd love to hear your input on that. And you can always reach us at info at bridgingvoice.org. Um, we have uh, about uh, 12 minutes, it looks like, and we have some great questions that have been submitted. So we're going to dive into those. Um, and as Trinity said, though, I think our team has agreed to stay late. So if your question isn't answered um, and you want to stay on to ask questions, we'll stay on uh, after the hour as well. Um, so I wanted to pull up. One second. Okay, so we had some great questions that were submitted uh during registration um one question trinity that we had from a couple of people faith and jill uh both asked how to chart the description of the ideal position so it is easily understood and repeatable for another clinician and i think you touched on this a bit but maybe you want to um speak a little more yeah absolutely i cannot tell you enough about how much i think pictures are helpful Mo Pictures as much as are, are really helpful as well. I use a lot of paper, uh, painter's tape. Facilities seem to be pretty accepting of painter's tape. 
So for example, even just putting a vertical line of painter's tape on the bed frame allows you just to get a position of where to roll the vertical post into place as a place to start, as well as having um, some, some marks or some lines on the floor. So for example, if you're gonna roll someone's wheelchair up and then roll a device up, that's another really nice option. But I can't stress enough, um, pictures. And we've got lots of other options, but if you wanted to reach out and needed some more information, please do so. Great. And then we had a question from uh, Chip, and I think Dana had a, a, a similar question about um, stopping the tracking indicator from jumping around. What is the best way to do that? Well, Nahum, you want to take this one, but can the, one of the first things I'm going to say is try an eye drop, preservative free. <laughs> But I'll let Nachum take it from here. And let me yeah, let me introduce. We have Nachum Lehman, who, if you guys do not know, is our technical director, who's on the call as well. So Nachum, did you want to take this question? Yeah, I guess it's it's really that's one that probably needs to be seen, you know, really up close. But you know, it could be dry eye, it could be baclofen, it could be many things. Baclofen is a muscle relaxant, and it can cause you know when you're trying to focus on a particular position on the screen your eye can just involuntarily move to somewhere else. And that could be causing a lot of jumping. So uh, if I had to guess, I would blame it on meds, um, but that's something that we probably just work together remotely and, uh, and try to troubleshoot it together. Yeah, and this is a great reminder that if, um, if you haven't already connected with our Bridging Voice team uh, and, and, and you're already working with one of our team members, feel free to shoot them an email um, to answer you know, questions specific to you. And if you aren't currently working with us, you can email us at info at bridgingvoice.org and we can set up a consultation with one of our team members. Um, okay, we have a question from Sandra uh, about what distance should my corrective lenses be to calibrate uh, to optimize success. Any tips for those who wear glasses? 18 to 24 inches. <laughs> Say it again. 18 to 24 inches. And some cameras have more specific, um, you know, uh, specifications, but that's the general rule, 18 to 24 inches, which I think is considered computer distance too. Great. Um, yeah. They, we tell people to get what are called task classes or computer classes. And the technical description of those is it's, it's a prescription which is halfway between your far prescription and your near prescription. So it's like halfway between distance classes and reading classes. And I don't think it gets more precise than that. Nice to see you, Jay. It's wonderful it's to see you, Jay. <laughs> Jay Beavers is Holt Technologies. <laughs> Great, and then we had a question from Aliza, um, who is asking about her son. Her son's eyes are getting weaker and he's having a harder time using the eye tracking technology to communicate. We're concerned that if things continue as they are, he will not be able to use it at all. How can we help him, especially at night, if he can't use his computer to ask for help? I know this has come up before with many of our clients. So I'm going to let Nakam answer the muscle aspect of it, but one of the things I want to restate again, is, as I stated earlier, was we oftentimes have clients who use different levels of, of, of um, keyboards or communication pages at different times of the day. This is definitely one of those that can be really helpful, especially for all pals that are tired towards the end of the night you've been, or towards the end of the day as you've been using your eyes all day and or you take your nighttime medication. Um, can really, of course, impact your ability to communicate. So please consider looking at having different levels of communication features for yourself on your devices. Nakam, I'll let you take over. Okay, I mean, that, that's a really, really tough question, obviously. Um, but the two things, I guess, that come to mind, um, number one would be um, making boards that require the least movement of the eyes that still works sort of like what Trinity is saying um, and be able to create customized boards to allow for typing, but using very few buttons. Um, but there is one secret, one secret tool that we have, um, which is, it's kind of, it's kind of weird because I've only had two uh, pals in the last many years that have benefited from this, but there are, there is one particular 
um, old eye tracker from Toby, the PCI Go, which for whatever reason it is, is the only camera that works with two pals that we work with that have the slightest, most subtle eye movements. And um, that's the only camera in the world that works with them. So, and it's been, um, Toby has told us that that particular camera they knew was able to track subtler movements than even their newer cameras. So there is an option with that to try that. Uh, it's not so simple to get because it's already nine years old technology that you can't get, um, but that would be an option for us to try. So another thing too to add to that too is, is uh, all right, I'll, I'll say, I'll share what Eddie, uh, Eddie Ehrlich, who's another one of our team members as well was sharing. Another customization is to sharply dim the screen at night and using dark colors and low contrast can be helpful. Um, and then again, this is definitely an area that we as a team are working really hard on right now. And I've said um, that we definitely have some more things to share in the future um, and are working uh, with some ophthalmologists and some optometrists um, at some research and learning facilities to figure out how we best can support eyes and address these muscle weaknesses and concerns. And Elisa, I, I will still, if you, if you haven't already reached out to us, please do, and our team, um, we can look at the situation specific to your son and, and um, address they're it. A, they're, a client. they're a client of ours. Okay, I assumed. <laughs> but yeah, we'd be happy to talk more in detail. Um, uh, let's see, oh, Margie um, had a question, which yes, it's a, a very good question. It comes up a lot about the difficulties for positioning in a facility with multiple caregivers. Um, uh, which Trinity, you touched on. Uh, so she asked, can Bridging Voice work with a person uh, with ALS in a skilled nursing facility? Also, would it be necessary to have an SLP present or could a family member assist? Great question. That is an absolute great question. So yes, we can work with people in facilities because again, we are not charging any fee to anybody. So there's not a, a double dip issue. Um, having a speech pathologist or another clinician present is fabulous, but I can tell you, it is not always necessary. We do work with family members, with activity directors, nursing directors, anybody who's vested and willing uh, to learn and to participate. We are happy to assist who, with whoever we can. We are truly here, you know, for the success of our pals and supporting, you know, everybody around them to make sure that they can be a, you know, a functional communicator. Yeah. And just to add to that, it's one of uh, Bridging Voices goals is to not reinvent the wheel. So when people have access to a great SLP or facility that can provide that support, wonderful. We're trying to work with people who don't always have that access and um, pals in care facilities are definitely high on that list. So we work with many pals in care facilities. Um, and I would say that uh, Oh yeah, Eddie is saying that he has worked with uh, points of contact in the care facilities that are chaplains, volunteers, maintenance engineers. Um, so Anybody. we have many, yeah, point of contact. The uh, a big indicator for success is having a consistent point of contact in the facility, though, because um, as you mentioned, there's always changing uh, uh, people within the facility. So um, that's really helpful. Um, and and to that being said, too, if there is a speech pathologist who is working with a PALS and you just need some extra support and or some ideas and or some troubleshooting or mentorship, we are happy to pair with you for you to be successful and support PALS. Absolutely. And then I just wanted to read, um, Ed Hitchcock had um, some additional advice uh, for Aliza about the trouble eye tracking at night. Um, Ed wrote, assuming that it's a Toby device that um, Aliza's son is working with, that the activate wake on gaze feature for overnight use of a device, the user can sleep the device and also wake it up if they need it, assuming a functional device. And most communication devices have that ability um, to be, in fact, I don't know one that doesn't, but they have the ability to allow to sleep and or rest. Great, so I think, um, that uh, we're just about out of time. Um, I just want to, uh, great. Um, I just want to invite anyone that wants to stay and ask uh, additional questions. We had many questions submitted in advance. Some of them weren't directly related to, related to this training, but our team would be happy to stay on after and answer, answer any questions that you might have. Um, but right now I'm going to stop the recording um, and anyone who has a hard cutoff 
um, can leave. And anyone that wants to stay and join us for an informal Q&A is welcome to. Thank you everyone from joining for joining us today. Thank you to Trinity for the excellent training. Um, and this uh, recorded training will be up on our website in the next couple of weeks. Um, and we hope to see you guys at future trainings. We really enjoy doing these. We lo really love uh, hearing your feedback. So please reach out to us, info at bridgingvoice.org. Um, and we hope to see you guys very soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.